Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Philip Securities Research Morning Call for 6th of June 2022. Um, today, for stock counter updates, we'll be starting off with an initiation on Silver Lake Axis, results for Salesforce, um, an update on Hyphens Pharma, and a few Philip on the ground uh, before wrapping up with our usual Singapore Weekly. So, without further ado, let me pass on the time to Glenn for Silver Lake Axis. Thanks, Vivian. So for Silver Lake, the our title will be New Cloud Driver uh, and Recovery Bank Spending. Also, so Nick, moving on to the next slide. So I'll be touching upon the background of the company. Uh, Silver Lake provides customized software solutions and core banking systems. It provides digital economy software solutions and services to the banking, insurance, payment, retail, and the logistic industries. So to date, it has been the banking solutions provider for 40% of the 20 largest banks in Southeast Asia. It has around 2,100 employees in over 80 countries. It was listed on the SGX SASDAQ in 2003 and moved to the SGX main board in 2011, with its current market cap at around $850 million. As of December 2021, the balance sheet in a, is in a net cash position of 493 million ringgit or 154 million sing dollars. So for the next slide, uh, touching upon its revenue model, it has five, uh, several revenue segments and I'll be going through each of them. So for the first one, it's software licensing. It made up about 6% of its revenue. And the group's main products include the Silver Lake Access Integrated Banking Solution, which is SIPS and the Silver Lake Digital Banking Mobius Open Banking Platform. And revenue from their software licensing fell 29% year-on-year in FY21, as customers continued to be cautious in committing to significant new software licensing deals in the first three quarters of 2021. FY21, sorry. Significant new software licensing deals begin to pick up in the fourth quarter, and it's anticipated that this will continue through to FY22. For its second revenue segment, that would be the software project services, which make up about 11% of its revenue. And this is related to the provision of software customization and implementation of services to deliver the core banking, payment, and retail solutions. So this segment's revenue declined 12% year-on-year -year in FY21 as several key projects were completed, nearing completion or delayed due to client requests. Nonetheless, the decrease in FY21 was mitigated by smaller scale contracts for SIPS technology refresh contracts secured in Malaysia in the second half of FY20, as well as a new Mobius and banking implementation contract secured in Sri Lanka, Thailand, and Malaysia in the second half of FY21. Now for its third revenue segment, this segment is the biggest contributor to the revenue, and it contributed about 76% of revenue. And this is where Silver Lake provides round-the-clock software support services as well as enhancement services to support its customers in the delivery and execution of their strategies in making available new capabilities to them. So these capabilities can be in the areas of new channels to augment customer experience and to address any new regulatory and emerging governance risks and compliance requirements. This segment recorded a growth of 10% year-on-year in FY21 mainly due to new maintenance contracts secured, as well as revision of maintenance fees for existing contracts. Its fourth revenue segment would be their sale of software and hardware projects. This is quite a, a small portion, about 2%, and it refers to Silver Lake's non propriety software and where it acts as a reseller to customers who require bundled one-stop solutions. The group is an authorized reseller of IBM hardware and system software in Malaysia. For its last one would be the software as a service. This segment consists of insurance processing, where Silver Lake's Merriman built platform processes, insurance claims, and premiums. And the second one would be retail, where Silver Lake is a cloud-based software as a service solution provider in the retail industry. So as I mentioned earlier, Silver Lake has two main products. So its first one, I uh, touched upon a bit was the SIPS, the Silver Lake Access Integrated Banking Solution. This is its core banking system and it runs primarily on the IBM AS400 power systems platform. SIPS offers the full range of commercial banking functions, including financing, loans, 
funding of deposits, remittances, a general ledger module, and the customer information facility, or otherwise known as SIF. Over years, Silverlake has broadened its platform capabilities to include the credit card system, internet banking, trade finance, and treasury solutions. Silverlake has also introduced its open banking, banking platform, Mobius, which combines customer-facing digital capabilities with core banking processing capabilities, uh, i.e. SIPs, to create a digital unified open end-to-end -end platform for commercial banking. This means customers can expand their core banking platforms to the Mobius platform, thus integrating their systems into one end-to-end -end banking platform. Furthermore, Mobius can be integrated across different core banking systems without the need to switch to SIPs. Silverlake is able to target both new and existing customers this way. And with Mobius being a cloud-based system, the cost is also lower than traditional systems, which are usually on-site platforms. Now moving on to the next slide. Next, the, is, this is an investment merit. So the first one would be that Mobius banking platform is a differentiator. And launched in 2020, Silverlake's Mobius cloud banking software allows banks to roll over new digital products in a targeted and timely manner. Banks can utilize the Mobius platform to coexist with existing core banking, soft, core banking software and propel them to new digital products. The potential users of Mobius include new products, digital products in credit cards, debit cards, personal loans, and deposits. The cloud-based software avoids the need for banks to purchase and manage hardware assets. Silverlake has recently signed a deal with one of the largest banks in Thailand and is continuing to see increasing inquiries in the region. We expect Mobius to generate almost 100 million ringgit of orders over the next two years. The second merit would be that Silverlake had stable recurring revenue despite the pandemic. So Silverlake means main revenue stream, which is their maintenance and enhancement revenue, it grew at a KGA of 4% despite the COVID-19 pandemic. And Silverlake's core banking software SIPs and continuous maintenance and enhancement provide a steady stream of recurring business for the group. The SIPs provides core accounting and compliance. So with the opening of borders and economies in ASEAN, we should expect Silverlake's customers to increase their IT spending to accelerate their digitization plans to grow. For the last merit, it will be that Silverlake had a record order backlog in um, FY21. So Silverlake's project pipeline is healthy at 1.7 billion ringgit with a record high order backlog of 450 million ringgit, which is a 50% year-on-year increase. This should keep them busy for the next one to two years. And Silverlake is also beginning to close more deals and is witnessing an uptick inquiries about its financial services, market solutions, and capabilities. They should be able to secure its foothold in ASEAN and look to expand into other regions. So for the next slide. So there are two risks. The first one being slowdown in spending and a weakening economy could create potential headwinds for spending among banks, which are Silverlake's main customers. Financial shocks would hit the IT spending first and the banks will cut back. However, Silverlake's main market is in ASEAN, which is aggressively reopening economies. Companies look at looking to recover post-lockdowns would need to accelerate their digitalization efforts to grow. The second risk would be increasing competition. So while Silverlake is the banking solutions provider for 40% of the 20 largest banks in Southeast Asia, it is relatively small compared to the global players in the industry. And these global players have gained contracts in Malaysia and Southeast Asia, a trend that is expected to continue as key banking systems reach the end of their life cycle in the coming years. Now for the last slide, we initiate coverage on Silver Lake Access Limited with a buy rating and a target price of 38 cents. Our target price is tagged to 20 times PE and is an 11 upside to peer valuations of around 18 times. Our target is also 15%, target PE is also 15% higher than the historical average PE of 17.5 times. In our view, Silver Lake should trade at a higher premium to its historical PE with the introduction of Mobius and resumption of bank IT spending post-pandemic. So that's all I have for Silverlake. I'll now hand it over to Ambrish. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn, and good morning, everyone. So today I will be sharing about Salesforce first quarter results. We had published the report last week with the title, No Signs of Demand Slowing. 
Next slide, please. So overall, the results were in line with expectations. Revenue and adjusted part me was at 23% of our 23 forecasts. So uh, in the first quarter, total revenue grew by about 24% year on year to 7.4 billion US dollars. And the main reasons for this were continued momentum in sales and service clouds. However, PatMe fell by about 94% year on year to 28 million. And this significant decline was mainly due to lower gains on strategic investments and higher operating expenses. Research and development expenses increased by 38% year on year and sales and marketing increased by 32% year on year. Meanwhile, Salesforce reported adjusted earnings per share of 98 cents in the first quarter, which was ahead of the company's guidance range as well as the consensus estimate of 94 cents. Adjusted earnings per share is basically a non-gap number where the company excludes all the non-gas expenses like amortization of purchased intangibles and stock-based compensation expense. Moving on to the first positive, Salesforce continues to see significant demand from customers for its core products. Sales cloud and service cloud revenues jumped by 18% and 17% respectively, and the main drivers were the product innovations and the feature like revenue intelligence. Also platform revenues, which include messaging platform Slack, they rose by about 55% year on year to 1.4 billion US dollars. Slack contributed revenue of 348 million in the quarter ahead of the company's guidance of 330 million. Secondly, remaining performance obligations, which consists of revenue, uh, future contracted revenue, which is still not recognized, it grew by about 20% year on year to 42 billion. And the current portion, which the company expects to be recognized in the next 12 months, it jumped by 21% to about 21.5 billion US dollars. So this highlights a strong demand for its software from companies that are looking to build better customer relationships for uh, better uh, boosting retention and sales. Lastly, multi-cloud adoption, it continued to increase as the number of deals that involve five or more of Salesforce cloud, it grew by 21% year on year. This suggests that the demand for its customer 360 platform remains strong. So a customer 360 platform, it basically connects all client data across sales, service, marketing, and IT departments on one integrated plat CRM platform. As well as the attrition rate, it remained at record low levels of 7 to 7.5%. Moving on to the negatives, uh, given the strengthening of US dollar, Salesforce uh, revenue growth, it was impacted by foreign currency headwinds. And the company had initially forecasted a negative hit of about 300 million for 23. However, uh, now the company expects uh, an uh, foreign currency impact of about 600 million US dollars, and that's an incremental of about 300 million. So moving on to the outlook mm -hmm. for FY23, Salesforce, it reduced its uh, sales forecast, but it boosted its adjusted earnings forecast. So now the company uh, expects total revenue to be in the range of 31.7 billion to 38.8 billion. This implies a 20% year-on-year growth and the revenue reduction, it was mainly because of the incremental foreign exchange headwinds. Uh, the earnings per, adjusted earnings per share is expected to be about 4.74 to 4.76 and gap and adjusted operating margins is expected to be about 3.8% and 20.4%. The main reason for uh, boosting its earnings, it was mainly because the company uh, expects to be having a disciplined spending approach and an increased focus on profitability. Mean Salesforce is not experiencing any material impact on its business from macroeconomic challenges like the rising interest rates. And this can be uh, negative from the uh, significant future contracted revenues, strong outlook for FI23, as well as uh, healthy free cash flows. The company generated free cash flows of about 3.5 billion in the first quarter, as well as uh, it ended the quarter with about 6.9 billion in cash. So finally, we nudged a FI23 revenue forecast by 1% due to a negative impact from foreign currency exchange headwinds, as well as 
uh, as a result, uh, DCF target price, it was reduced to 253 from 258. And overall, we believe that the company is well positioned to benefit from broad product portfolio, customer stickiness, and digital transformation related spending by businesses. I would now like to pass on to Jonathan for update on property guru. Thank you. Thanks, Ambrish. Uh, so today we'll be sharing um, just a fill up on the ground on property guru who did a podium webinar with us last week. Um, just to reiterate, property guru is non-rated right now. And so we'll just be running through uh, uh, some of their first quarter 22 results uh, as well as their brief uh, business model. Uh, okay, so Property Guru was listed, uh, I believe, in March on the New York Stock Exchange. They've got a market cap of about $990 million US dollars. Uh, they are predominantly a digital real estate marketplace, uh, but they also do, uh, they also are a, a mortgage marketplace and they also offer B2B enterprise solutions. So they, they recorded a revenue of about $28 million sing dollars for the first quarter of this year, uh, which represents a 42% year-on-year uh, increase. Uh, marketplace, uh, marketplaces make up the most of its revenue at 96%, um, of which uh, Singapore uh, makes up more than half of it, about 55% of mar marketplace revenue, uh, closely followed by Malaysia and Vietnam, who represent about 20% each. Uh, in terms of market opportunity, they've got a growing Southeast Asian population that currently stands at about 470 million uh, people. Uh, they also have a, they have a significantly uh, fast-growing middle, uh, middle class. Um, and, and there is also increasing digitalization in the region. So in terms of their marketplace, uh, how they really generate um, revenue uh, is through their recurring annual subscription models for listings. So uh, essentially what, what they are is just a, a digital classified ads where they, they sell packages for uh, agents and developers who are their main customers uh, to, to list you know, any property for sale or for rent. Uh, in terms of the breakdown, most of their listings come from uh, residential properties. Um, and, and there is a larger mix of, of properties for sale compared to properties for rent. Uh, they, they do also leverage uh, a little bit of on uh, artificial, artificial intelligence AI to, to kind of help with their algorithms and their searches. So for example, it, it enhances their, uh, like, like if, if, if a, a customer was looking on their platform for a certain property in a particular area, uh, they would then be able to, to use an algorithm to, to suggest you know, other properties of similar type, similar value uh, within a, either in a similar region or or it could be even another region, another part of, of Singapore, for example, that, that has uh, similar uh, properties in terms of its em environment. Uh, they do also have uh, this AI model on their app where, they, where users are able to take a picture of, of, a, of a, a neighborhood with, with you know, several properties nearby. Uh, and the app would be able to tell you uh, what are the properties there, you know, whether there are any. Uh, properties for, for on uh, property listings uh, on, on the platform. So like I mentioned earlier, most of their customers for their marketplace are uh, agents and developers. They do also help developers uh, market their new projects. So they do a little bit of digital ad advertising for them, uh, as well as, as automate uh, the whole sales process for developers. Uh, they have a smaller fintech business that, that represents uh, uh, you know, 5% or less than 5% of their total business. Uh, and this includes a mortgage marketplace, uh, so where, where they match um, uh, mortgage seekers with banks or mortgage providers. Uh, and this is predominantly, uh, not so much, I guess, in Singapore, but, but in other regions as um, where there's a bit more uncertainty in, in the property market. Uh, and, and there's also a little bit less trust and, and a lot more ambiguity in, in the market. Uh, they do also provide uh, a, a prop, proprietary data and workflow solutions, and then this is targeted towards B two B customers. So, like like your developers, uh, banks, auditors, uh, etc. Uh, in terms of their overall growth strategy, uh, they plan to increase the the ARPA, which is their average revenue per agent, um, uh, through deeper products and pricing. So, so more products, uh, increasing pricing. Um, and so this number stood at about $1,000 for, for the last quarter, which was a 25% year-on-year growth. Uh, 
So how they calculate ARPA or average revenue per agent is by taking your uh, average agent or your total agent revenue for let's say a quarter and divide it by the, the average number of agents uh, during that quarter. So they also plan to to do some uh, M and A activity to complement its existing fintech and data services, uh, especially with uh, significant cash on hand from their their listing. Uh, they are planning to to use this cash to to just uh, kind of acquire companies that, that will help them uh, grow in the future. In terms of that, their out, the company's outlook, they expect this year to have a 44% year-on-year revenue growth. Um, and they also expect the company to be to be positive adjusted EBITDA for FY22. Uh, so with that, I'll, 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 I'll pass my time now on to Vivian, or Terence, sorry, for SETS. Thanks. Yeah, no worries, John. Thanks. So this is SETS Philip on the ground. We don't have any coverage on the counter. Uh, so for SETS, they are a chief ground handling and in-flight catering service provider at Changi Airport. For fourth quarter 22, their revenue came in at 7.5% increase on a year-on-year -year basis. Uh, PetMe was positive at $2.1 million. Uh, however, without government reliefs, PetMe would have been $13.6 million. Food Solutions uh, and Gateway Services were, was up 6% and 7% respectively. So in terms of their key operating metrics, this uh, uh, actually improved across the board. Some of the key uh, operating metrics that we looked at were flights handled, meal served, uh, passengers handled and cargo tonnage uh, all, all increased across the board uh, in line with the reopening. Uh, one, the negatives, however, were OPEX uh, surging ahead of revenue, uh, surging 31.5% on, uh, on, on a year-on-year -year basis. Rather. Uh, this was attributed to higher staff costs uh, due to a combination of lower grants and uh, also the increased hiring. The food solutions margins also tightened in the quarter uh, due to rising food costs. Uh, management guided that negotiations with the airlines are taking place, uh, but there will be a lag uh, between the, 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 the current price increase and the, the time that they can pass this on to the customers. Uh, the China lockdown will also continue to drag its operations. Uh, the greater China operations were down uh, over 9% uh, on a year-on-year -year basis. Uh, so, so until they, they are able to... to uh, until China reopens, uh, the, 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 oper the operations in Greater China will continue to, to see a drag. In terms of their strategy, they continue to hire in anticipation of the travel recovery in second half 22. Uh, they recently held an employment fair, which, which they deemed a success uh, because they received many uh, applications for, for the positions. They will also, uh, SETS also will continue to invest in its non-travel business uh, to diversify away from the, the, the main travel business they had pre-COVID. For FY22, the non-travel business accounted for 43.9% of its overall revenue. In terms of its balance sheet, they have a net cash of $275 million uh, and debt to equity actually improved to 0 0.46 times from 0 0.5 times last year. The, the metric that we are watching closely is the core pet me, is its core pet me X reliefs because the 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 reliefs that they are, they are getting is uh has, has been reducing over the years uh and will also continue to be, be, be reduced as uh with the as Changi Airport continues to open up and we continue to open up to uh, other countries so the the core pet me X reliefs came in negative forty two and a half uh million dollars for this year. Uh, versus $33 million last year. So, uh, it, it, so it's, it's taking a hit. And OPEX is expected to continue to climb uh, as the group hires in anticipation of the recovery. In terms of the outlook, as at 31st March uh, of this year, cargo has reached pre-pandemic volumes. Uh, flights and passengers just handled are at 44% and 25% uh, respectively. New surf across all segments reach 59%. Uh, but one, one key area that they are looking at is uh, Japan's reopening on the 10th of June, which they believe will be a, a, a good uh, catalyst for the group uh, and its TFK business. So that's all for me on sets. And I hand over the time to Vivian. Thanks, Terence. Um, so our next counter will be Willis Array Electronics. This is a flip on the ground for their second half 22 results. And uh, it's also non-rated. So for Willis Array, they do distribution of electronic components. 
um, its three largest segments being industrial, automotive, and home appliances, contributing 70% of its total revenue. And its key principle includes uh, ST microelectronics. So for the second half 22 results, um, the company recorded a lower revenue of 1.64 billion Hong Kong dollars, and net profit was also lower. So uh, zooming into the various segments, if you refer to the pie charts on the top right, there was higher contribution from automotive and home appliances segments, while industrial segment revenue dropped. And on a full year basis, the revenue contribution from the auto segment increased from 18 to 21%. And in absolute terms, this is a 12% increase. And also, this is the only major segment that recorded a, an increase year on year. So this is mainly due to the rapid increase in the adoption of EVs and also due to the fact that the industry in general is uh, prioritizing um, this auto segment. So on the margins, uh, gross profit margins have remained stable at 10%. Under the current supply shortage conditions, uh, management shared that customers are relatively price insensitive as they are more concerned about the availability of the products as compared to wanting to negotiate the prices. So regarding the lockdowns in China, uh, management shared that there is more logistics flexibility uh, now as compared to maybe a few years ago. So in view of the lockdowns in Shanghai, uh, the country could actually redirect shipments to Hong Kong or Shenzhen. So as such, companies which only have facilities in Shanghai may be more seriously impacted. Uh, but for Willis Array, they have facilities in many different cities in China, including both Shanghai and Shenzhen. Regarding the lead times, um, it's differing across segments regarding uh, whether it's shortening. So for certain segments like consumer electronics, it's normalizing as uh, demand is gradually cooling down. But for other segments like automotive or energy saving, uh, they still remain long due to the fact that demand still remains very high. Uh, but for Willis Array, they have also successfully managed to build up their inventory levels as can be seen from the chart at the bottom right. Lastly, for the outlook, um, these segments are expected to benefit from policies that support China's environmental targets, which includes automotive, uh, clean energy, and also power saving appliances. So that's all for Willis Array. Now moving on to a Philip on the ground for LHN, which we hosted uh, them for, for a poems webinar. So for LHN, the two main revenue drivers, um, Kaliu or co-living uh, spaces, which is their co-living brand, uh, which is like service apartments, and also work plus store. So for, first for Kaliu, uh, just would like to emphasize that uh, they offer flexible lease terms. So first thing is you don't have to sign one year in advance. You can stay for maybe a minimum of a few days or a few weeks. And they are also competitive in terms of affordable rates and being well equipped with facilities like uh, the picture at the top right, you have your uh, kitchenettes, attached bathroom, washing machines, etc. in one room. And they also have shared spaces to be able to interact with the other uh, tenants. For Kaliu, management is expecting to see continued strong demand from young professionals. This is in terms of local demand, uh, especially with the hybrid work from home situation to stay. Um, and as the Singapore re borders reopen, there will be added demand from foreign students and expats moving into the country. For Work Plus Store, the newest outlet is at 202 Kalang Baru, referring to the picture at the bottom right, uh, which commenced operations in October last year. And LHN continues to see strong demand from e-commerce business owners and also for personal storage use. So occupancy at both Kaliu and Work Plus Store are basically full. On the other industrial properties, LHN acquired a property at 55 Toa South under a joint venture. And there are plans to develop it into a food factory kitchen. So the company is also looking into various interesting kind of assets and develop to serve as a service. For facilities management, the Kabak business continues to do well and they also provide cleaning and related services for their own properties and also REITs. And to make up for the lower dormitory management revenue, 
LHN is also rapidly expanding their energy business, and this includes EV charging and also solar panel installation. On questions regarding inflation, rising interest rates, and possible recession, uh, management also shared that they are poised to benefit from rising property prices, and they have hedged their borrowings by already fixing their rates, uh, interest rates for the next two to three years. Um, on the valuations, the company is trading at attractive valuations of about four times FY22 PE. This is based on an adjusted uh, EPS, which is excluding the fair value gains on investment properties, and also 4.7% dividend yield. So lastly, for the outlook, uh, for the two main revenue drivers uh, for Kaliwu, the number of keys is expected to re reach 1,500 at the end of uh, FY23, and this is about twice um, the figure in FY21. And the target afterwards would be to add 1,000 keys per year. For WPS or Work Plus Store, they are targeting to add one property per year. So for FY22, it would be the property at uh, 202 Kalang Baru. So all in all, the company continues to branch out into interesting assets and provide them as a service as can be seen from their recent investments. So the last counter for me would be uh, a flip on the ground for LHN Logistics, which we also hosted a poems webinar. So for the logistics side of the business, they have two main segments, uh, transportation and container depot services. Um, on the first half, 22 revenue, Revenue remains um, almost flat, while the adjusted pet me after excluding the one-off listing expenses was up about 13% year on year. So referring to the pictures on the right, under transportation, the workflow basically involves um, collecting ISO tanks from the depot. Uh, then they uh, go to the chemical manufacturing plant at maybe Jurong Island and load the chemicals, store them if necessary, then transport to PSA for export. So with the new ISO tank depot that is um, planned to finish construction next year, LHN Logistics would be able to do bulk storage of dangerous goods or what they call DGs. Um, and they are also able to integrate the washing and repair services for ISO tanks. So currently, um, they had to store the DGs at the third-party yards. So soon, they will be able to save on this cost. And as such, they are expecting better margins. And um, the company also is competitive in terms of being punctual and safety, maintaining safety levels. LHN Logistics is also the largest ISO tank operator with 40, 54 tanks. So moving on to the container depot services segment, the workflow involves receiving the containers, uh, washing, repair if necessary, storing and uh, inventory management, and finally release the seaworthy containers for usage. So depot handling charges have risen in line with the overall sentiment of inflation. So uh, margins have also remained stable. Um, for LHN Logistics, they are able to turn around the containers quickly, which is another point of uh, the competitive, competitiveness of the company in the industry. For the Thailand Container Depot, they already saw the capacity double as compared to pre-COVID period when it just began operations. And even then, they were profitable. So if you can uh, imagine from 20% to 40 or even 60%, then most of it would probably go directly to the profit level. Um, regarding to the lockdowns in China, the management said that they think that it could benefit Southeast Asian economies more as more goods are redirected over to these countries. According to the IPO price of 20 cents and dividend payout ratio of 40%, the indicative dividend yield is 4%. And lastly, for the outlook, they are able to command higher prices also due to the shortage of cleaning and washing services for ISO tanks in general. And other than the new... Uh, ISO tank depot, we are expecting higher revenue from the container depot services segment. So firstly, you have the new one in Myanmar, which is expected to commence operations. Regarding the situation in Myanmar, uh, management also explained that the ports are still operating as usual, and uh, while the political situation has also simmered down. And the one in Thailand is um, expecting increasing capacity. So that's all for LHN Logistics. I'll now be passing the time on to Paul for Hyphens Pharma. 
Uh, thanks, Vivian. So this is regarding our report uh, we issued uh, today. It's just an update on the hyphens from our next slide. Uh, there were basically two updates. Was uh, Firstly, was to update our financials and secondly, was to just discuss about the latest 10% disposal of the uh, digital healthcare assets to uh, Metro Holdings. Uh, so in terms of the event, uh, so Metro Holdings invested 6%, uh, 6 million for 10% stake in their digital healthcare assets, uh, which they named it as DocMac. So if you look at the chart, there are two parts to the assets uh, owned by Hyphens. So Hyphens has, uh, uh, has a medical hypermart. Basically, what is hypermart does is that if clinics want to order drugs, like the cotton buds uh, and, and any other supplies, they can go to this uh, website and they can just order and they will get it directly from uh, Hyphens Pharma, which is technically under the, the Pan Malaysian name. Uh, the other digital access is called Well Away. So what Well Away does is mainly to cater to, uh, to teleconsultation. So after a doctor conducts teleconsultation with their patients, if they want to dispense drugs, uh, the only uh, registered or licensed in Singapore is Well Away. So what happens is that so they prescribe drugs, they will just uh, inform Well Away, then Well Away will make the delivery and prescribe the drugs because you know, prescribed drugs are controlled. So only a few can do it, or I guess uh, only one for now. Uh, for us, in terms of the event, uh, in terms of how we, we view this e event, uh, we think that this could uh, this is a positive in the sense that it will provide funding and then they can enhance their platform uh, to go regionally and also to enhance the platform because right now it's they don't even have a mobile app so they want to add on mobile app and ultimately the key thing that we're watching for is to have more doctors joining and purchasing on the platform uh, and we have not actually added the 16 million because on paper six percent stake of uh, for 10 percent means that the digital assets is worth 60 million i mean which is huge compared to hyphens market cap of only 19 million but we have not included that uh, uh, because we prefer to see enhancement, we see the prefer to see the platform grow. Uh, we, we what we want to see is more doctors, and with that they can get like more pharmaceutical companies joining in. And an important new revenue stream is the, is uh, you know the most difficult is just to get doctors into the platform. Because uh, and once you get that, then uh, the pharmaceutical companies will come in and it will become like a, a pseudo shopee, but mainly uh, for doctors only. Then. Uh, this platform can earn revenue from the high margin revenue from the pharmaceutical companies. I mean, th that's the game plan. Uh, so for us, we upgrade to buy, but mainly because of the acquisition of Novem. So we raised the earnings by 40%. Uh, this is um, inorganic because they acquired this in November. And you can see from the first quarter, no, uh, the results for Hyphens Pharma was up 40%, was purely because of the growth uh, acquisition of Novem. Uh, in terms of our view, so... Uh, the ultimate object strategy for Hyphens Pharma is to grow their, their skin healthcare uh, under Ceredon and TDF across the region. So that's the main uh, objective, but this is another new share price catalyst uh, for them in the longer term. In the near term, the growth will come from, again, sorry, acquisition of Novem. It was, it's a one-off jump in earnings. But also right now, what we see in the healthcare sector is that the return of uh, elective surgeries. Because due to the pandemic, a lot of elective surgeries have been kind of held back. So as a result of this, there's a bit of panel demand and this will benefit their specialty pharma, which is uh, what, what they provide is, uh, is when you're doing the x-ray, there's a chemical that's used during x-ray or, or, or MRI. Uh, which they actually supply to hospitals in Singapore and also in uh, Vietnam. So that will be the part of the business that will be benefit from high, more elective surgeries. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. So uh, let me move on to our usual update on, on Singapore. Uh, in terms of the macro, we have manufacturing activity. It is more or less stable, better than the April uh, uh, last month. It is below 20, 2021, uh, but it is uh, but still higher than 2020. So what we're having is a slower than 2021 manufacturing activity, but it is still growing and it's still much better than the, the 2020, the worst of 2020 during the peak of the pandemic. Uh, what was very uh, strong in Singapore was retail sales. So consumer spending in Singapore is exceptionally strong. So retail sales excluding motor vehicles, uh, we exclude motor vehicles because you no know, motor vehicles are very lumpy. Uh, in April, it grew 17%. Uh, this is, 
you know, pre-pandemic retail sales usually, excluding motor vehicles, usually grow maybe two, three percent. So this is I don't know, five, six times more than than trend. And it's a continuation of March. So what has done well is like watches, apparel, a lot of consumer discretionary. Uh, surprisingly, or a pleasant surprise is also supermarket, which is still healthy at 5% growth. You know, despite uh, borders opening and more working, uh, um, more people going back to office. Uh, and a reflection of why consumer spending is still strong, if you look at average monthly earnings, so this is monthly earnings compiled from CPF contributions, uh, from salaried employees that contribute to CPF. So you can see that uh, this is a record level, it's up 8% year on year. Uh, and this is the highest growth rate in a decade. So uh, salary compensation in Singapore is I guess, very high. So that's why you get this number. And that's, I guess, supporting the retail sales in Singapore. Uh, the numbers from this is SBS Real Transit. So this is an uh, important indicator that we, we monitor to determine the real traffic for Comfort Delgo and SBS. So right now, it's still down 0.7. Uh, but it's coming off from a weaker March, 20, uh, March 22. So it is improving, but at a gradual pace. So it will be interesting to see how May develops as uh, more, more people go back to office and so forth. Uh, in the US, I won't run through too much. I think these were the payroll numbers that is all over the news. So it's, it's still strong, about 390,000. And if you look at uh, pre-pandemic, the last three years, pre-pandemic 2017, 2018, the trend rate was usually maybe 180,000. So we are still like, the uh, number of payrolls or number of new jobs uh, created is like double the rate of pre-pandemic. So it's still a very strong employment market in the US. Now, ISM is just, uh, again, this is just to monitor manufacturing activity in the, in the US. It's stable. I mean, it, it is still better than pre-pandemic, May 19 of 52.5. Uh, but of course, it's much slower than 2021. So in general, manufacturing activity like you see in Singapore and US is slowing down from 2021, but it is still better than pre-pandemic levels. In terms of our technical view, we still view probably in a very range-bound market. Uh, until we get some clarity on the interest rate cycle, even if we get positive job numbers, uh, that any optimism on growth will just be fanned out that maybe the unknown is just that the Federal Reserve may raise even interest rates even higher not now that they see the, the economy get still strong. So that's why we think you know, equity markets will likely trend sideways until we see some some hints of a peak in the interest rate uh, cycle. Uh, for us, our base case is that by September, um, when the Federal Reserve hits close to their so-called neutral rate, so right now, the Federal Reserve rate is 0.75. So once they hit maybe 2.25, 2.5, we think there might be signs that the Federal Reserve will slow down. And one of the reasons we think is because you no know, monetary policy is limited. I mean, raising rates is not going to help the supply chain in China and, or even in, in Europe. And it could only just dis, uh, no, cause demand to, to, de, to it can only destroy demand. So we think that could be one consideration why they may still raise rates but at a much slower pace. Uh, in terms of the events next week, I think the most important will be 10 of June when the US released a CPI. Any indications of, any we can only wish, I guess, but it's probably not likely. Any signs that month on month, you no know, inflation is trending down strongly, then there'll be signs for the market to rally, but... Uh, probably unlikely now. Uh, in terms of the webinar, we, we are pending, uh, we have hyphens pharma, but, but it's not on poems yet. Uh, there's a possibility we also will be getting new, but again, it's pending uh, confirmation from the same. But uh, just do watch out for them if you watch out for it, if you have the time to attend. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, so uh, I guess recession is, is always on the news. So we, we wanted to, of course, it's easy to guess there's a recession next year, but when we look at the indicators, so the indicator on the left is a composite leading indicator. It's a combination of a lot of indicators, but the good thing about this is it has a very long history since the 1950s. So if you look at this indicator, it's a combination of uh, wages, combination of labor, uh, even the stock market and bond interest rates. So it's com compiled by in the US. Uh, so this indicator, usually when it goes negative, that means when it goes below zero, that's when uh, inflation is upcoming. You can see it uh, happening multiple times. Um, so right now, it hasn't gone negative, but obviously it's decelerating very sharply. So we, the base case in 2023 is, of course, economic growth was slow. Uh, whether it tilts to recession, is, we can't see it in the indicators, especially for, from this US composite leading indicator. 
if you look at the yield curve, which is another indicator which uh, we also use, you, if you look at it again, you always uh, the it will invert. That means you go negative, which is the ten year is lower than the two year bond yield. Uh, you can see from the chart when it goes negative again, that's when it's there's, there's a uh, consistently there's usually a sign of a recession coming. Uh, again, the yield curve actually bounced back up, so there is still no signs of of that. And usually, if it goes negative, you take probably six to 18 months before a recession happens. But again, there's no signs of course, it's, it's easy to guess right now. But again, we, there's no indication from our indicators. Uh, next slide. Uh, we move on to, to KSH, Philip, on the ground. Um, so KSH is, uh, we thought it was quite interesting in the sense that firstly, KSH is a property and construction company, market cap 200 million. So they have the usual, you know, typical construction work. They also have property development, normally on a joint venture basis. And for some reason, they have nine hotel investments, or seven in the UK. I'm not, not sure how that came about. But anyway, uh, their NEV, uh, sorry, NT, uh, NTA, sorry, not, not NAT. Uh, the NTA is about 60 cents. So right now, they're trading like 40% 40, 40 discount to RNAV. Their net cash, and they are paying like a dividend yield of, of 6%. Uh, the results is about, Profit was about 24 million uh, or 22, excluding minority. Uh, most of it was supported from associates and joint venture. If you look at the table on the bottom, you'll we'll explain later. So for construction, they didn't do well in construction. It's virtually just break even because they took most of this that they're recognizing now as revenue were, were tenders they secured during the pandemic. And then after that, you no, know, you have delays and then you have lack of workers and, and also rise in construction costs. So their margins are now four to five percent compared to what they should usually get, maybe eight to ten percent. Uh, of course, uh, in terms of cost, everything is rising because everything is imported. Uh, they are also affected by supply chain in China because China you get most of the building materials like cable, leaf, and glass. In terms of the labor, uh, so most of the bottle right bottleneck right now is labor, but labor won't be recovering as robust as uh, as everyone expects according to them because what happened what's happening now is that you can bring in workers which is better than pandemic time you can't but the problem is that uh, there are also workers leaving so there have been workers foreign workers here they've been here for two years and after two years they also want to go back home so net net you still have an increase but it may not be as large as expected in terms of the foreign workers here that can help in the construction activity so most of their earnings come from property so what they do is they have joint ventures you know, with the other developers, maybe like Lambing and so forth, or even Oxley. And then they, they launch all these projects like Affinity, Riverfront. So attributable billings means, uh, that means property that they sold, but yet to be recognized as revenue. So it's about 200 million. And you know, if you assume a 10 million, uh, sorry, 10% net margin usually for property developers, there's another 20 million of profits to be recognized. Uh, and of course, some of the new projects that they did was like Peace Center. So right now, the focus right now is to, is to have an integrated project with commercial of 60%. Why this 60% is important is because if you are 60%, then your residential won't be have uh, ABSD. So as you know, for ABSB, within five years, you, if you don't sell anything, you're going to be, there will be the uh, ABSB to be imposed on the developer for the land purchase. Even if one unit is, is, is even if one unit is left, you're still going to be imposed ABSD. So to uh, one good one, I mean one way to, to avoid that is just to have more commercial, like 60% of it. Uh, the other big, big project they have is Kaupi 10, but uh, it, it was the, the it was the project that actually took the share price to 80 cents. But right now, because of the lockdowns in Beijing, uh, this project is meant to, to cater for Beijing residents. But again, with, with the lockdowns, um, they can't even come and if they come to this area, they're going to quarantine. So obviously nobody's coming over to go and buy properties. Uh, in terms of the outlook, uh, this is a, a deep value stock, about 40% discount to RNAV. Uh, we think net cash could jump because uh, what happens is that once you sell all your properties, uh, there's about 100 million of loan to associates. Uh, so, so let me just explain. Oh, when, you, when you are a property developer or when you invest, let's say 20% in a, in a property development project, no, and maybe your equity, that means equity to the associate is 20 million. You usually won't put 20 million inside. You maybe put 1 million as shares and the balance 19 or you put it as loan to associates. So most times when the property development project, you want to put loan because you can get the money back return. Otherwise, to get back capital, you know, you've got to you know, 
you have to make liquidation, go to call and apply for capital reduction. So it's easier to just lend to the joint venture. So if you look at the balance sheet, there's almost 100 million of such loans to associates. And once the property project like Affinity, Riverfront, all done, then they can collect back all the money and they could get almost like 100 million of worth of cash back from associates. So their net cash should balloon up and they should be able to sustain this uh, two cents dividend, if not even pay a special, which I don't know. I'm just, just speculating here. Uh, next slide. Okay, we go to our usual uh, absolute 10 performance in May. So for me, our model portfolio was down 3.7%. It's in line with the STI. If you look at the table on the right. Uh, what drove us down? The banks took a hit very badly in, in May. Uh, DBS and also our small cap names like Del Monte and even uh, HRNet. Uh, next slide. Uh, in terms of the, this is just an overview of stocks that did well and sectors that did well. Uh, on the right is all those stocks that did well. Uh, on the bottom is the STI. So most of the STI gainers came from Jardine Medicine. You can see the venture and so forth. The banks put down the index and also especially the REITs. If you look at the bottom right-hand side, what drove down the index was mainly a lot of the REITs, uh, Maple Tree Logistics, uh, Fraser's Logistics, and, and especially the whole Maple Tree group. Uh, in terms of on the on the left, uh, sectors that did well, again, just for your reference, shipping did well, that's mainly because of Samcom Marine inside there. Uh, what didn't do well were the REITs office, uh, mainly because of Suntech and also finance didn't do well. Again, uh, this is just for your reference. Uh, next slide. Uh, in terms of asset classes that did well, uh, this is measured in US dollar. Uh, what didn't do well was, again, REITs and gold. Uh, what did well was actually the commodity ETFs. In blue is year-to-date performance. So you can see that commodity ETFs are still the best performer, almost 40% up. The worst is NASDAQ. Okay, uh, next. Uh, this is my final slide. So we, we, we looked at Yang Chichang Financial again. Uh, again, this is the restructuring. So, so it, just as, as a recap, so the book, the sorry, the NAV for Yang Chichang Financial is around $1. Let's make it for simplicity, $1. So we, uh, this is exactly what we did for the slide. So we think maybe it could trade to 0.6. But I guess the interesting thing was that after being kicked out from the SDI, the interesting thing was that uh, they committed to at least 40% dividend payout. So if you do back backwards, this could imply a 7% yield. Uh, and the other interesting thing is that uh, when we look closer at the balance sheet, although the problem is they don't give, the, uh, they don't disclose until the next coming results. There's no real details. It's all, all these are just our own estimates. So out of the 4 billion book, uh, NAV book value of 4 billion, uh, we think a lot of it is cash. Uh, why we say so is that uh, if you look at these debt investments, this 3.2 billion, so most of these are basically loans in China. Uh, but the, the thing is that most of these loans we, we estimate maybe 90% is actually less than one year uh, be, because they don't really land very long term. They land maybe at most one year, maybe longest three years. So, but the bulk of it is all one year. And we think that if they don't land out and they transfer some of this cash back to Singapore because that's their plan to grow Singapore, you are looking at a, a, the share price now could be trading at net cash. Again, you know, it all depends on how much they want to land out or not. But if you assume half of their book, half of the loans, this 3.2 billion is cash. So the plus the cash they have here about 300, you're, you're looking at a 2 billion net cash company, which is quite comparable to their market cap now, 2 billion. So just to go through the three final points, no debt investments basically are loans. Financial assets are, are private equity investments, which you know we can't really consider them as cash. So that one is, is just like assets. So, so the, but the downside to this is that uh, of course, the good thing is uh, is cash, but the bad thing is with cash, you earn less than lending it out. So we think earnings could probably drop. The earnings in 2021, if you look at the table on the left, sorry to jump around, but it's like 350 million roughly, sing dollars, depending on, on the exchange rate. So we think this could drop because they won't have so much uh, interest income. But this company at the current price could be trading at uh, net cash levels. Yeah. I mean, this is just what some, some of the calculations we did, just an estimate. Uh, next slide, I think... I think this is the last slide. So thanks everyone. I think we can uh, move on to questions. It is question on property. 
Yeah, recently Property Guru merged with iProperty. Does 2022 revenue include iProperty? Uh, how is the gearing ratio? Yeah, so um, I, I guess they, they bought over iProperty. And if you look at the, the first quarter 2022 revenue, you can see that, that uh, revenues from Malaysia jumped significantly. Um, uh, to almost 200% from 1.8 million to about 5.4 million. Uh, this was uh, because of uh, it already included the, the revenue from iProperty. And in terms of gearing ratio, they don't really have, have much debt. Um, they have about 11, oh, sorry, 17 million um, in borrowings, another 17 million in warrants liability. So if you combine both of them, um, you get about a, a, a gearing ratio of about 5%. So that's very low. Uh, yeah, hope that answers your questions. Thanks. Yeah, I'll take the next one. Could, could you please share with us what the non-travel businesses sets have and how fast are they growing? So the, some of the, the non-travel uh, businesses sets always had before COVID is the uh, food solutions to the, the army camps and also uh, so food solutions to the army camps rather. And then uh, during COVID, they, they, they supplied some of the food to uh, for the foreign workers dormitory as well. One of the, the non-travel business that they are embarking on is the restaurants business through the twist uh, business that they have. So they, they currently have one restaurant uh, at Raffles Place and uh, in the, the Raffles link and that they say they have seen it has already turned profitable and profit has been uh, doubling on a month-on-month -month basis. So for this month, the month of June, they're actually opening a second restaurant uh, in uh, also at Raffles Place. Uh, I believe it's at Asia Square. So uh, that they say is important because it gives them uh, uh, data insight into the consumer. For example, what they like to, 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 to eat at a restaurant, they then replicate this into when they when they provide the meals on, on the plane. So this is this what this is one area in terms of how fast uh is growing for FY twenty two. It's still a very new business, but for FY twenty two, uh, it grew about eight percent on a year on year basis. Yeah, I think that's all. I'll hand over the time to the rest of my colleagues. Um, I'll take the one on the banks. I think as a <clears throat> there are two questions about the outlook on the banks. Uh, I'll just quickly go through each bank. So for DBS, uh, we feel that their business momentum remains strong. And even despite their economic uncertainties from the macroeconomic factors, such as the slower growth, high inflation, and supply chain disruptions, their loans and transactions pipelines are expected to be strong. The DBS management has also said that the stress tests of vulnerable sectors in our countries review no imminent areas of concern. So their GP reserves are also sufficient. And we believe that the bank has sufficient provisions to write out the current economic uncertainties. So their CET1 ratio, although lowered by 0.4% Q on Q to 14%, it is still at the upper end of the DBS's target operating range. And lastly, uh, on interest rates, they have mentioned that a one basis point rise in interest rates could raise their NII by about 18 to 20 million. And so if you have to assume the heights of about 100 basis points this year, that our NI, FY22 NII can climb by 21%, resulting in increase in the PME by 26%. So moving on to OCBC. For OCBC's outlook, um, their loans growth firstly grew 8%, in the first quarter, and this was meeting their guidance of mid to high single digit increase for full year 22. And the management sees further lending opportunities in the wholesale segment and sustainable financing. Their mortgage pipelines in Singapore and Hong Kong are also healthy, with more drawdowns expected in FY22. Also, now to the interest rates, their management has guided for stable names of 1.5 to 1.55% for FY22. Nonetheless, you said that based on the historical data, 100 basis points increase in rates would lead to a 18 basis points increase in NIMS. So to assume rate hikes totaling 100 basis points, our PME can increase by 10%. So for OCBC, um, just give me a minute, let me pull it up. 
Regarding the latest news about the additional uh, MES capital, let me give me a minute. Huh? Let me find the mines. Sorry, okay, I'll get back to that later. I'll just move on to UOB first. So for UOB, the outlook is that their profit should continue to grow in 2022 on the back of stabilizing margins, stronger fees, and lower provisions. And we expect the NII to expand 14% year on year. We also continue to expect the credit cost to come in below the guidance of 20 to 25 basis points. So for their NIMS, um, the, and the interest rates, the management only expects improvement in NIMS in the later part of 2022. And ULB has said that a 25 basis points rise in interest rates could raise their NII by 150 to 200 million. So if you assume again, 100 basis points rate hikes this year, the, our FY22 NII can climb by 11%, resulting in a PME increase by 17%. So for their loan growth, the asset quality is expected to stabilize and management expects to continue to see strong demand for loans as cross-border activities pick up. And ASEAN loans growth is expected to be higher with some slowdown in Singapore and North Asia. So growth so far has been skewed towards the developed markets as the ASEAN economy remains muted, but management expects this to change in 2022 as the economy recovers. So UOB has guided for mid to high single digit loan growth for FY. 22. Okay, so for OCBC, sorry, going back to OCBC, regarding the MES's um, additional requirement uh, due to their digital, uh, uh, sorry, the phishing scam. And um, one of the big reasons why there's a, such a big difference with OCBC's additional requirement uh, and compared to your, uh, DBS's one, it was because the deficiencies were actually in response to the phishing scams and not really a breakdown in the systems per se. So DBS's one was where they, their systems um, failed and they had to sort of like fix it. Whereas OCBC's one was more of an external um, error. And however, so what would this mean for OCBC? So this the additional penalty will impact their CT1 ratio by 0.21%. And this would mean that OCBC's CT1 ratio is now 14.99% or maybe 15%. And this actually will not affect them too much as it is still the highest amongst the three local banks. DBS is 14% and UOB is 13.1%. So the, wait, let me see, there's one more question. So um, with rising interest rates, surely it must be good for the banks. Yes, I think I mentioned the how the rising interest rates will affect all the banks. The, Second question is, why are they negatively hit of, hit of late? Uh, this might be due to the overall market. I think it's just uh, people are, are more cautious now. And also, they would want to cash in their profits. I mean, the, the banks are still higher, uh, higher definitely than maybe a few years ago, one or two years ago. So maybe people are, are more cautious, so they're trying to sort of uh, sell to cash in their profits. But I don't think the, the, this current uh, sort of cycle will affect the banks too much, as I've mentioned the previous points about regarding their loans growth as well as their names. So I hope I answered all the questions regarding the banks. Let me just take a look. Yeah, that's all I have for the banks. Okay, I'll hand it over to the rest of my colleagues. Thanks. Yeah, uh, uh, let me just answer this. Oh, sorry, wrong background. Um, can I just? I uh, will just answer this before I move on to to uh to 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 Vivian on some of the questions. Um, because this was the most voted up. SPA Street become unconditional now. Any implications to unit holders who do not intend to accept your offer price? Your view about 
the offer price likely to be revised upwards. Yeah, just to give some background. Oh, sorry for the camera. Uh, just to give them some background to everyone. Uh, what happened? So, uh, so I just bear with me. Uh, sorry. Uh, because SPH owns SPH Read. Uh, then when Cascaden made an offer for SPH, then by default they had no choice. They had to make an offer for SPH Read. They own like sixty six percent. Uh, then because this offer is quite unique, uh, some of it is the shareholders can take all cash for SPH or take SPH read, and it's a bit complicated. But uh, when the offer was 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 made, it was conditioned. That means this offer only stands if uh, Cascade owns more than fifty one, which they actually have done so. So in terms of the thing, uh, the sh the offer price is nine three seven, and the price now I think is higher than that. So I think there's no no implication if you don't accept the offer, the shares will still be trading. Uh, I think Cascaden has number one mentioned they will they want to keep the SPH read listed so it will still continue listing as normal. Uh, whether they will revise the price upwards, I think there is no need uh, since they already own fifty one percent. Then they do have control, and because they do not want to privatize it, then there's no need to raise the price uh, to them. Uh, this is the, probably the best scenario. Just 50, just nice of uh, fifty one fifty two. That means they paid too much already. So fifty one is the best now. <laughs> 50, sorry, 50.1 50. is probably the best number they want because they just want to control and they, they want to keep it listed. So these are the two objectives and this has already been, been met. Uh, so we don't think they will raise the price. Yeah. I, I hope, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Yeah, I hope I, I help, uh, help answer the question. I'm not sure if it's a bit too long, but yeah. Uh, can, can the rest answer, take on the rest? Okay. Uh, sorry, can I take the... the sure, 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 go ahead. Okay, thanks. So I think there's another, uh, this, this question about the banks, I missed it just now. Uh, how do we reconcile many analysts are bullish on the three local banks, yet their share price are dropping and the institutions are selling out the three local banks for the past month? Is the market starting to price in recession? Yes, there's definitely one point that the market is starting to price in recession. Um, however, I mean, I mentioned earlier the strong the points on why banks would be doing well. And also I think I need to mention one more thing about their, uh, sorry, give me a minute now. About the, the GPs, so their provisioning. Um, we do not see that the provisionings for banks would uh, increase and actually they have sufficient provisionings now to, all, all three banks that have sufficient provisions to write out any uh, economic uncertainties in the near future. And most of their assets are in um, ASEAN and Singapore, definitely. So with the, I mean, most of these countries are now opening up. So I, we do not see that there will be an uptick in uh, the GPs. So I hope that answers the question. Thanks. Uh, Vivian, over to you. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, there is one question on... Can you show the second last slide where Paul mentioned that NASDAQ was the worst? So I think this, this slide. Um, then moving back to the questions. Um, for sets and Willis Array, has no rating from your presentation. Can you explain why from Poem Stock Analytics shows uh, the ratings for these two counters? I think uh, is just basically there was coverage on this uh, counters previously, but as of now, we do not have coverage on uh, the counters. And uh, for the next question, LHN Logistics is up 15% today to 18.2 cents. Something going on that you know, uh, not that we know of, I think basically for uh, stocks like LHN Logistics, mainly just due to its low liquidity. So the changes in the stock prices uh, could be quite large. Yeah, just that. Um, again, on LHN Logistics, how do you compare LHN Logistics and Asonic Aerospace strengths and weaknesses? So I guess if you were to compare these two companies, it's not a very fair comparison uh, because they do different, they are engaged in different parts of the logistics business. So for Asonic Aerospace, um, they are mainly involved in multimodal transportation uh, then that also, other than that, that also includes uh, warehousing, distribution, uh, customs clearance. It's more of like uh, taking care of the goods that uh, are transported around the world. But for LHN logistics, they mainly do transportation of uh, chemicals, dangerous goods for the ISO tanks. 
and also container depot services in terms of uh, servicing the containers, making sure that they are uh, seaworthy of usage. So it's different parts of the logistics business. But anyway, for LHN Logistics, um, I guess the strength would be that, uh, or maybe on the revenue drivers going forward, uh, mainly would be the new ISO tank depot uh, that is that has commenced construction, but is probably only expected to complete uh, in the somewhere in the middle of next year. And then from there, you have to take another maybe six months to ramp up the capacity. So that would take some time. Uh, but then again, for these ISO tank, they are able to enjoy the first mover advantage in terms of integrating all the services you need for uh, servicing your ISO tanks. So that is uh, a strength. Um, on weaknesses or maybe on some kind of uncertainty, I would say on the may maybe on the container depot in Myanmar, whether uh, in terms of the capacity ramp up, um, it's I, I guess for us, it's a bit uncertain. Um, for ASONIC Aerospace, um, I guess the strength for them would be in terms of the scale, uh, which allows them to be able to get the spaces uh, because the, uh, in, in terms of the competitiveness uh, comparing to their other global competitors. But weakness would be that um, for the revenue makeup, it consists of actually mostly wholesale, which makes up about 70 to 75%. And uh, the, the other 25% is retail. So for wholesale, it commands much lower margins because it's mainly just transportation uh, of containers from port to port. So as compared to retail that involves uh, value-adding services, including after you trans uh, transport to the port, uh, they are able to further service their clients in the sense that they, are, they can uh, add value-adding services to transport further to the warehouse or even directly to end customer uh, taking care of the insurance and all that. So that is that would help them uh, get higher margins. But the fact is that the business contain, uh, consists of mostly wholesale. So hope that uh, helps for this question. Last question um, that I see would be any update on Del Monte. So Del Monte is releasing the full year results, I think in another two weeks. So, but um, regarding the recent announcements on the new financing of 600 million US dollars at 4.75% uh, interest rate per annum, this compares to the previous uh, very high interest rate of about 11.9%. Uh, so just would like to say that they are basically, we can see that they are on track to uh, getting lower loans at lowest interest rates. So that um, it's also stated in an announcement that they are expecting pre-tax interest savings of about 20 to $30 million. But of course, uh, this the net effect would possibly be, we, we can only possibly see in FY24, as uh, in our latest report, we also shared that they are expecting some one-off costs due to the early redemption of the uh, $500 million US dollar loan. Yep. So I um, think that's all for me. Uh, now I'll pass the time on uh, back to the rest of my colleagues. Okay, thank, uh, thanks, Vivian. Uh, let me just... So the next uh, most voted is uh, Hua Hong is making a voluntary conditional cash offer of 37 cents. Please advise your view. Whether is it favorable? Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I don't cover Hua Hong. I mean, it's mainly a lot of UK property assets. Um, I guess the only two things I can say, uh, sorry, I'm very limited in my understanding of this company, but uh, you know, an insider make an offer of uh, you know, very high chance, not just them, any insider would, won't be, would, uh, no in insiders, right? So insiders obviously know the real value for this company. So whether is it a, f a fair and reasonable value, I think we can I can't really say much. I think we, have, we can get the hint as since the insider offering. Uh, but I guess you can just you just have to treat it as a liquidity event for 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 minority shareholders uh, because the share the offer price or the current share price now is like five year high as far as I can see, and before that there's virtually no no volume. So even though if the offer is not fair and reasonable, in the end, it's a liquidity event. So I guess my, my only limited advice is maybe sell 
maybe half of your of your of your holdings and then just to take advantage of this liquidity event because without this offer there could be no there's virtually no trading the last couple of years yeah I, i'm just sorry just a quick glance yeah so it, it yeah this is sorry this is the best i, I can give because i don't have enough information yeah they will the best is just to look at the independent valuer because they will have the most transparency because a lot of these assets are property so whether they actually given the latest mark to market valuation so the property valuers valuation will be very critical which i don't have the latest number so that will, will be the key consideration yeah but i guess in a nutshell just treat it as a liquidity event and might have to sell a little bit because if the offer doesn't go through you and if they would they own less than 90 percent you can imagine the liquidity will be even worse if they own if they consolidate and in it and they don't have enough assuming they bought the control up to 89 percent then the float will be even worse than before then the liquidity was already bad now it can only be worse if they fail in the offer yeah again i don't have the details so i'm just thinking a lot yeah i just hope that uh, it, it helps you in your decision making uh, uh singtel share price has been going down any views um nothing in particular post results maybe the market was speculating they might have they might have done they were going to do some monetization of the associates yeah that's why the share price took a pop but apart from that uh we we still have uh we, we still like singtel uh, because of roaming that will help singapore and, and to a certain extent australia uh, the reopening in asean will help all their regional associates and of course india will continue to to, to grow and they have three billion of assets to monetize or at least has some path to monetization so that could also help the share price yeah oh okay so this is a long question uh, uh hi paul before speed young chichang was 155 your last night fair value of 156 which does not show any improvement does this mean that the speed didn't add value uh okay uh the speed in a way you could say it didn't really have value because the split make them look get kicked out from the STI. So like, now, like half of the business is no longer on the STI. So net net, it may not have added value from that perspective. Yeah, a young Chang shipbuilding is in the index STI, but the other part is not in the STI, the financial. So it, it, in a way, it it in uh, how to say it, uh, in very diplomatic way. Yeah, I mean, on the it didn't add value in the sense that they they, they got lost. They lo they lost out in their index weighting. Yeah. But right now, I, I, I still think maybe Yang Zhichang, there's value there because the balance sheet could be very liquid. Yeah. Uh, Hypovich is the better choice pick, hyphens or IX. Uh, so hyphens will be a bit slower in terms of the growth. Uh, for me, I still like IX Biopharma because uh, although the deal they make, the farm out, that means they, they, have the, they own the a drug that is phase two. So right now, is with uh, the, the other company in, in the US. So that, that company will do so, but I still think they've got many other drugs because the key technology is the waferix technology. So why we liked it, you know, um, covering a biotech sector, biotech stock, especially drug development is, is like a mine, it's a minefield and probably a lot of, or a graveyard because if you're relying on one or two products, I mean, how are we to know whether the drugs will work, right? But what, what we decided to cover is because the platform, there are many drugs. So they, they could the, it could be not only just for this drug, it could be multiple drugs for it. So just that recently, there hasn't been much news flow. So we, uh, we just look out for more news flow on new drugs. Because this is not the only drug that they can do, which is the ketamine-related drug. There could be other drugs. So that's why we, we still, if I had to compare the, uh, what has the better upside, we still think RX Biopharma has the better upside. Just that, you know, you're de dealing with, with, with drug companies, it will take a long it's a long gestation period. Although it was disappointing, the, the farm out didn't get much because people were expecting big pharma to take up the, the take up the licensing, but it didn't. So hopefully they can announce news with some big pharma names and that could maybe give them some re-rating or some legitimacy, I guess, for people to assess their the potential. Yeah, okay. Um yeah. Uh Hi, the REITs have dropped and institutions are selling out for the past two months. When do you foresee turnaround in price of the REIT sector? Does the theory of real estate a good inflation hitch and REITs predominantly hold such do not hold anymore? Okay, uh, do you see a turnaround? Okay, for, for us, I mean, Natalie is, is, is Natalie in the call. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Because Natalie is not in. I think she's gone up for for a uh, work visit overseas. So for for us, um, we, most what I most favor is the uh, hospitality weeks. No, because the recovery that we see, I think we spoke about it. The recovery that we see in hospitality, which is hotels, uh, although rates are up, what the first wave is uh, leisure travel. The second wave you're going to get is the business travel, and then the third wave, the biggest one of all, which all of us should go traveling before it is open, is the China wave. So for I mean for 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 us, we we view hospitality the best because. We can see clearly there's good this recovery you see is just the first wave. There's going to be another two more big waves coming up for hospitality. So that's why we think hospitality like escort read is at least for me, like, it's one of our favorite. I mean, Natalie would have, might have a different view. Uh, there's the theory of real estate as so a good inflation hedge. Uh, there is okay, there are two parts to it. Whether it's an inflation hedge, it comes from replacement costs. So if you uh, again, this is in this theory, right? So let's do the theory, but uh if the cost to build a building rises, uh, because material costs rise, so when replacement costs rise, then the value of the asset will increase, and that is why it's an inflation hedge. Uh, the European REITs have a better in, are a better inflation hedge because a lot of their rents are tacked to inflation rate. So, uh, like if you look at some of the the rentals for some of the property, let's say Singapore property or Singapore mall, it all depends on economic activity and negotiations. But the European REITs like Cromwell and so forth, uh, a lot of them is just packed direct to CPI. CPI up five percent, then you just rent my raise my rent CPI. So, those are really a a, a clearer a clearer uh, inflation hitch. So in general, REITs uh, there is some inflation, but it's not very clear cut. It's indirectly through higher replacement costs. And REITs predominantly holding such do not hold anymore. Uh, yeah, I, I think right now, because of rising interest rates, uh, we have to pick those REITs, I mean, at least for us internally, that can grow their, grow their rents uh, well. And the rental reversions need to be very strong because you got two big headwinds, so you got higher, higher costs uh, higher interest rates, although they tell you there's H, but you know H, how long can you H? Not H forever, right? So it's like SIA telling you can H few, but how long can you H? So it's the same thing. The H has limit, there's only a one year, two year value. So, uh, and also because you know, when interest rates are higher, the attractiveness of REITs, you know, why buy a 5% real uh, REIT when the, maybe the Singapore bonds are already trading at 4%? So, so for us, just have to be very selective of our own view for whichever REITs can give the best rental reversions. That's why we like hospitality. And we are very wary of those who have long wheel, like we said. Anything that is long wheel, you end up being like a bond. I mean, in the past, we like long wheel because long wheel means you know, there's less risk, you know, the, the wheel long. But the problem with long, why people give you long wheel is because you cannot grow your rents, right? Otherwise, if I'm a REIT, why would I want to give you long bill? If, if my rent is going to grow 5%, why I want to fix it for 10 years? So, so the, 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 the strategy has changed a little. It's kind of 360. Sorry, I'm not the analyst, but anyway, let me just give you the, my view. Okay, well, this is a lot here. Uh, MM2 and Richard have been highlighted in previous presentation. And just to recover, uh, there's a slide on price, even though the entertainment business is opening. Any hiccups? Okay, so for... MM2, the big albatross for them, the, the big overhang is the cinema. So there's a convertible bond of 50 million. So they need to, to settle that convertible bond. Uh, yeah. So I think for MM2 is mainly due to the sorry, it's, it's mainly due to the cinema and the debt on the cinema. So that's the main thing, even though there's a recovery. But this is the deep, the deepest, the most aggressive way to play the recovery. Uh, unusual the concerts are returning so that's that's clearer but for MM2 it's going to be the cinema uh, because there's, the, they just leverage up too much when they bought the cinema so until the cinema recovers even stronger that, that's the thing how they're going to settle the, the cinema the debt on the cinema especially the convertible bond that's due but what's your take on Metro uh, I didn't go can someone help on Metro I think someone went Mm, okay, I will, I, will I will just answer Comfort Delgro before someone answers the metro question. Uh, how is Comfort Del Delgro and Singtel with opening? Um, so both are, uh, uh, both are beneficiaries of the reopening to travellers. Uh, but for telcos that like we highlighted in the past, uh, 
Starhub is probably the biggest because Starhub is pure play, where Singtel, you still have a bit of associates earnings here and there. So for pure play on roaming revenue, it's going to be uh, Starhub, which accounts for, we guess, maybe 40-50% of earnings comes from roaming. But of course, uh, right now, you don't have China roaming. That was one of their biggest markets. But I guess there's going to be pent-up demand once it opens. Yeah. Uh, how is Comfort? So Comfort, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's a benefit because uh, probably less known is that a lot of taxi income actually comes from trips to and from. Uh, one or two trips, you virtually can cover your rent uh, from airport travel. Yeah. But both are beneficiaries of the reopening. Uh, your, Paul, your comments on unconditional status of SPH Street and implications if one were not to accept. Yeah, uh, again, in case you missed it, um, there's no implication. It will just stay listed. The intention of the of Cascaden, the one that the company that made the offer is to keep it listed, which I guess you need to. I mean, if you're a read, right? If uh, unlisted read, there's probably no value to you unless it's very cheap. Any view on Hua Hong? Yeah, so I think we mentioned it. Uh, APEC Reality can still buy. <laughs> uh, we prefer prop next, I think, for us. Yeah, we, we, we didn't cover APEC Reality. People ask why. Because we wanted to just cover the, the, the biggest player there. Uh, no, it's not like banks. The banks are so big, you have to cover all three banks. But for property, the real estate agent, you know, you, uh, agency, you don't need to buy two. You just buy the, the fastest growing and the biggest and the one that has the best balance sheet, which we consider that to be prop next. So that's why uh, for us, if you want to play, uh, you'd rather just buy prop next. But this year will be a tough year for real estate agents because transactions are down 30, 40 percent. So there's virtually no earnings momentum. But at least for Propnex, uh, we think they will try to maintain uh, maybe four or five percent dividend yield, which has always been their intention to keep this as a dividend yield stock, especially with their strong, I think it's now 300, uh, 200 or 300 million net cash balance sheet. Okay, any latest update on Tassin? Uh, uh, sorry, that one I'm not really sure. I think Natalie's not around, so can't help you on that. Apologies. Yeah, you can ask her maybe next week. Okay. Uh, can you help out on the banks? Yeah. And Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, what is your view about CDL Hospitality Trust as a hospital? Yeah, I, I think we, again, never looked at it closely, but for us, we just up, up beat on all hospitality reads. Uh, sorry, uh, until Natalie comes back, then we can give you more color. I just don't have details on that. Yeah, apologize for this time. But you can ask her next week. Uh, yeah. But what we've seen, I think like our data, I think uh, the ref path for hotels in Singapore up 60% year on year. So we're definitely going to benefit CDA Hospitality Trust. Uh, Tuan Singh, regular dividends 0. 0.7. Is it better to accept cash or script? Okay, our view, this very general statement, uh, whether is it cash, dividend or script, if they... If the script is cheaper than, I mean, this is very obvious, but if the script they give you is cheaper than the market price, then of course you take the script. Yeah. Again, it depends how, what is the arrangement. The, the key important thing is how they value the script. If not take cash, I can always take the money and buy myself. Yeah. So uh, our, our preference will be cash unless the script dividend they give you is lower than the current share price of Tonsing. And I'm not sure about the liquidity. Uh, if you take uh, Tuan Sing shares, if the liquidity is not strong, then in the end, you're, you know, you're holding to something that's not liquid and maybe cash might be a better option. Again, this is just a general statement. Uh, uh, I don't have the details. Um, uh, 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 Vivian or Terence, can you mention on Metro? If you... Yeah, uh, maybe I will start on the metro uh terence can chime in if he has anything else to add uh so basically for metro during the briefing they mentioned that their revenue increased about uh 14 percent year on year uh but of course if you come that that is comparing to uh the lockdown of around two months uh in 2021 but on the profit level if they take out the uh government grants uh job support scheme and all that um, they mentioned that for FY22, they did get a profit of uh, 0.5 million uh, as compared to uh, excluding the one-off grants, it was a loss of 9 million in FY21. So this is uh, quite a significant recovery as they see stronger traffic and revenue, um, especially in Causeway Point. So they have two outlets, one in Causeway Point, one uh, in Orchard. Um, but 
uh, Orchard side is still missing the traffic from medical tourists. So uh, relatively, Causeway Point is doing much better. Um, the big impairments of China properties, they just mentioned that in, it's more of like a, taking a conservative approach um, on, on the China side of investments. So on the China property sector, they are still remaining cautiously optimistic as um, they are also unable to travel to China to you know, like go and assess the properties and so on. So they will first uh, focus on assets in other countries first. And maybe when China reopens, then uh, probably would be looking back at China properly again. Yep. Okay, let me just try to answer all these questions and then we should be done. Uh, some of the US banks like Jamie Diamond, I, I think Jamie Diamond mentioned this is one possible scenario, I think. Yeah. He didn't say the probability, I guess, but he just said one possible scenario because there is slow you down. Uh, like we highlighted earlier, uh, can someone just show the, the, the slides, the, the, the recession part thing? So for us, we don't slow down is a is a definite yes, but recession we don't see it yet. So uh if you sorry, can you go back to the chart again? Uh, if you look at these some of the indicators, I think you no, know, it's easy to just guess and say or oh, recession is coming, but if there's no proof or no indicator to point to that, it, uh, it's hard for us. So for us, we, we, can, we got to justify, and we, don't, we can't justify what, we, what the indicators are telling us right now. So we don't see a, a, a recession right now. We only see a slowdown of uh, activity. And the problem is that in this slowdown, you're also seeing rising interest rates, which will, will, will only make the slowdown worse. Uh, but for us, we like the banks because right, higher interest rates is going to benefit. And the slowdown is not more developed markets rather than, than ASEAN countries. So that's why we still like the, the banks, although there's this thing called slowdown happen, happening. I yeah, hope, hope that helps. Uh, uh, would the latest successful land sale give impetus to counters like Singland and UOL? Okay, uh, we, we, we don't cover both, but let me just uh, give you what we told uh, we met a developer, one of the large developers recently in Singapore. So uh, we gave them this our feedback on developers to them. So what we told them is that the problem now, most investors view uh, Singapore developers as a value trap. Uh, you know, some can trade 40, 50% to, to, to RNAV and investors are so not interested. Especially when there were certain privatization deals. If you look at some of the recent privatization deals, some, most of them were also done at, I don't know, 40% discount to RNAV. So... Uh, so ideally, what we wanted from a, the developer is that if you hold commercial properties, uh, if you can generate dividend income from your rent, that means if your recurrent income is strong enough to give a, a reasonably attractive yield, maybe 4 or 5%, then at the very least, then investors would, would like that. Then at least they know that I'm, I'm getting a strong yield, a yield and then there's upside to the uh, NAV, RNA, RNAV as they monetize assets, you know, as they develop and there's more, more profit. So for us, uh, ironically, uh, to make it attractive, you need to give investors a recurrent string of income, uh, which is like a 4%, and this must be paid out in dividends. Ideally, uh, otherwise, it's going to be hard to promote uh, property stocks uh, because, again, they're still viewed as value trap. So unless, although they may have a land sales, they might have bid well, and they might generate profit, but until they can monetize, that means what in, analysts want to see, I'm just saying for myself, maybe rightly or wrongly, uh, they just want to see the to, to narrow the gap between the NAV and the share price, the discount is you need to do some path to monetization. That means you sell a building or then people, oh, okay, then you monetize. Otherwise, this NAV is just you know, it's just there, can forever be there. That means the, your NAV could be three dollars, your share price 150, but it's forever three dollars of people because you're never gonna uh, there's no path to monetizing it. But if you pay dividends, then people don't mind holding to your stock. At least they know that uh, I'm getting paid to wait for this monetization. Uh, again, this is just a general comment, which we also mentioned it to a, recently in our meeting to a developer. So just to go back to the answer, the land sales, yeah, I don't think it's going to help much. The problem is that if the property is, price is too hot, then you know authority is going to cool down. Yeah, ironically, so to write, it's very hard to do a trend, to go and buy on trend for this type of property stocks, because the hotter they are, means the more very likely they're just going to be another round of cooling measure. And that's the, the issue we have. Uh, how is River Stone and Top Growth uh, with opening gradually? I, uh, 
there are positives and negatives to it. Uh, with the reopening means there'll be less demand from developed countries because that means the pandemic is wearing off, then there'll be less demand. But uh, we think the demand will come from developing countries. And so uh, developing countries, especially latex glove, will be where the demand is coming from. Uh, whereas nitrile, uh, sorry, uh, nitrile is synthetic rubber and then latex is natural rubber. So latex is where the Chinese competitors are, uh, are not there. They don't really expand. Most of them do synthetic. Uh, synthetic is mainly used in developed countries because uh, protein uh, allergy concern. But China, even China used natural rubber. Glue. And if you have worn one before, the texture is better. It's a better feel and more comfortable. So uh, it's a bit neutral on the reopening. I don't think it's going to be a big beneficiary for Riverstone and, and, and Top Glove. But Riverstone is benefiting because they still can keep their gloves at $100 for a thousand piece because they, they have a very strong brand name in the electronic sector. So semiconductor companies use them and they are the, the, the market leader for that. That's why although glove prices are maybe $20, $30, but their gloves are selling like $100. So they still benefit because they got the brand, brand name established through many years. Okay, so th uh, th thanks everyone uh, uh, for, for all your questions and, 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 and do sign up for some of our webinars and hope, wish everyone, uh, thank you for your questions and hope everyone have a good week ahead. Thanks again for your participation and your questions. Bye-bye everybody. Thank you.